As the story of the early church is told in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul has been traveling around the ancient world trying to help people understand, to hear, to accept, to live the good news of God's love. He's gone to other smaller cities, and now he comes to Athens. Hear what the Spirit may say. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way, for as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence, the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed. But others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us and the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. There were groups of five or six Presbyterian ministers sitting around round tables under a high-beamed ceiling. Laughter and excited conversation sparkled throughout the room. At a Credo conference last week, we tried to nurture in the minister participants healthy life, physically, emotionally, financially, vocationally, and spiritually. There were tearful conversations, there were poignant moments of insight and inspiration, and we had some fun. For our party celebration that night, leaders like me donned super, superhero capes and masks and Rosie the Riveter outfits to set the tone. Around their tables, the participants created titles and theme songs and their own outfits and scripture passages to express superhero powers they imagined possessing. Now, like I said, these are ministers. So we had the peacemaking guardians of Shalom. We had some kind of transformers quoting Romans, do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by renewing our mind and heart to discern God's will for what is good. There was another group that I can't quite remember, something with water, maybe their superpower was baptism. They wrapped up their mascot, a guy, in this blue-green plastic sheeting to look like a mermaid. And they sang, under the sea, under the sea, and finally, poking fun at our thoroughly Presbyterian ways, there was Sulk, S-U-L-C, the super ultimate league of committees. <laughs> I wonder what Marvel could do with that one. Presbyterian ministers having fun, and in a way, playfully reinforcing the purpose of the week to create a rule of life that is a pattern, a rhythm, an orientation of the heart to guide all that we do together, all of our life. How do we ground who we are and guide all we do in the power of God's love? It's not just ministers. Isn't that what we are all called to do in our living faith? Isn't that 
the tone that Jesus set in his ministry, life, death, and resurrection. That's the holy superpower that Paul tries to help people possess. That's why he goes to Athens, which in ancient Greece is something like a combination of New York City and Washington, D.C. He's fleeing contentious attacks. That's the part just before what we read. They ran him out of these other smaller cities attacking him. And now he arrives in the bustling center of culture and he quickly ends up at the Areopagus. It's akin to Capitol Hill, where the highest government council meets, our, our Congress and Supreme Court combined, and where Socrates was on trial and executed precisely for not properly worshiping the gods. Now, however threatening Paul's encounter was, he claims an opportunity to engage the vast scope and the very heart of Greco-Roman culture. I see how extremely religious you are, he begins. It's a compliment. He builds a positive connection with those with whom he's speaking. Athens teemed, you see, with temples and altars to gods with all their various superhero powers, and Paul invites them to go a little deeper in relation to the Holy One whom we worship. It reminds me of conversation we hear in our time about being spiritual but not religious. When someone says, I'm not religious, what does that really mean? Usually it's something about feeling a holy impulse without regular routines of faith. I wonder, is there a particular expression of faith against which someone rebels? Maybe a particular experience or a perception of church that wasn't so positive. And I wonder if there's another way to view this very question. When we look at contemporary culture, don't we see something like the opposite? Can we see how religious we really are, yet often needing more spirituality? Here's, here's, here's what I mean by way of, of two basic observations about being human. First, in many ways, friends, we all live relig re religiously. That is, we have daily rituals and patterns and routines. That is, you know, what coffee or tea or favorite breakfast do you start out with every morning? We invest our heart, our time, our resources regularly. What teams or shows do we follow devotedly? What causes do we support generously? We share these activities with so many others, viewing parties, right, or shopping trips, or Facebook, anyone? At best, these practices give us pleasure, and they nurture in us inspiration. Beyond the dogmatic creeds from times past, we trust certain kinds of knowledge, like science or maybe our favorite news source, to turn our inspiration into action. And amid all these patterns and activities, all the knowledge, all the emotions we feel, we develop a frame for how we view our world, and we seek something more than mundane. In some way, friends, don't we all live religiously? Second, though all our routines and responsibilities may take us somewhere, don't we all know that life is more than surface experiences strung together in sequence. We often face the deeper questions about purpose and our relationships. In our work, our health, our families, our community, we feel restlessness inside us, yearning for meaning and, and for peace. A sacred desire for goodness and hope and joy pulses with every heartbeat we have, even in the most difficult places and experiences. Of course, we vary in our particular ways that we seek and we express spiritual depth, but still, all of our hearts are restless, as St. Augustine once said, until they rest in God, however we define and relate with the divine. Now, for St. Paul, when he got to Athens, they all must have seemed as restless as, as what? Batman without his gadgets? <laughs> Wonder Woman without her lasso of truth. I had to figure that out just this morning before worship. Or maybe all our children after they're eating donuts in the men's breakfast. Rather than contesting, rather than 
going to a place of criticizing their many deities and rituals. Paul connects with those human impulses that are already so evident. Affirming their spirit, even quoting their poets, he relates their altar to an unknown God with the holy ground of all life in whom we have our very being. Now, friends, I love this story. And after a week at Credo and returning home to to y'all to share our journeys, our joys, our sorrows, our plans and questions, I come back loving the church. Yes, we're imperfect. Yes, there are times when people flee conflict and threat like Paul did long ago. Yes, the church is not the assumed center of society like it once was. But still, among those ministers at Credo and on our ministry together, I feel hope. The clarity that Paul offers in Athens is what we can find and what we can provide right here in Kalamazoo. It's clear that in all we do in church, God calls us to engage the vast scope of culture and the very heart of our lives with the good news of love divine. It's about our Bible studies and service and our programs and our property, our finance and fellowship, all fulfilled ultimately in the way we live in our social ethics. It's about bringing spiritual depth to our everyday routines. It's about the risen Christ coming again and again and again among us. As John tells the story, it's Jesus' farewell conversation It's his last attempt to encourage the disciples to continue in his way, truth, and life that he just told Thomas about. It's his final appeal for us to frame and to infuse all we are and do with the greatest commandment, loving God and loving neighbor. Friends, Jesus promises that as we open our hearts and minds to be empowered by God's Spirit, then we can meet hatred with love. We can pardon injury. We can bring hope and light and joy amidst even the deepest, darkest, saddest, despairing places. And the risen Christ will live as we live in that abiding love, as we share his gift of peace, channeling the fullness of life that God intends for all people and all creation. Our lives and world will be judged, Paul says, in the righteous power of this divine resurrection so much greater than the ancient Greek gods or the best superhero imagination. Now, does Paul do a little bait and switch then with the Athenians? Is there a little carrot before the stick? Is there a little good humor before the hammer blow? Is that how we in the church should engage the world with good news? Judging the world in righteousness, as he says, seeks not so much condemnation, but correction. That is God's order of grace and mercy coming to its fulfillment, in which all people share abundant life. No exploitation, no prejudice, no insensitivity, no arrogance that seems powerful at times and places today. Yes, amid our daily routines and religiosity, let's say, Yes, we have deeper responsibilities we bear. We have judgments that we must make. But Paul's word doesn't carry the full caustic connotation that we hear sometimes. It really means to separate, to distinguish, to, to consider and to decide, to live informed, not ignorant, when old categories and distinctions don't work anymore, to look for new ones, to travel right roads, to share kindness, to live service in the grace of God. Friends, be aware of all of our personal routines. How do they fill us with love and goodness or fear and frustration? Be thoughtful about what's really important in the way God wants our world to be and us to live. Be conscientious about how our lives inevitably impact other people in the choices we make, what we purchase, how we work, or how we have fun. 
as much as possible, be passionate in every moment that is filled, that is pregnant with potential for love divine to dwell in our hearts and be revealed in human life. Living with, a, with awareness, with thoughtfulness, with conscientiousness, with passion, that's what repentance really means by Paul. Now, if Paul came to Kalamazoo, what do you think he might say to us today? How might he encourage spirituality amid our religiosity in all of our various ways? Amid all the regular routines and deeper questions of our days, how can we search for trust in and then spread the good news of God's love and resurrection throughout the world? Living faith is not escape from the realities of our lives and world. It's not a weekly respite in our favorite sanctuary alone. Living faith becomes meaningful and inspiring precisely when it relates with the struggles we face, with the news we hear, with the direction that we yearn for. Today we celebrate with our youth as they graduate high school and with Rob as he sort of graduates from leading our youth ministry program. They will commence life through years ahead, as we all do, and will come to discover, by the grace of God, special powers that we didn't yet know we had. Through all we learn in classes and life experience, friends, more than power, and that's in money and in our education and privilege and positions that we achieve, our superhero power in love, divine, all loves excelling, can enter every joyful, every humble, every trembling heart. Through all our daily routines, the ways that we are re religious in our, in our lives, keep, keep searching for God. Search from our personal lives through our church life together unto all of our community and world. Sure, be real. Accept, face the potential threats like the corrupt human powers that crucified Jesus and that Paul must have faced. Yet trust that the sacred spirit who raised Jesus from death brings us new life by the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the hope that was embodied in the risen Christ. Be grateful that God created us and all people in goodness and that God loves us still and forever. And when we seek God in and among all things, then like Paul, look. Look to find and to express positivity and hope and goodness and possibility in and among others that we meet. Build on affirming connections rather than criticism and contention and condemnation. And if even Presbyterian ministers can do it, then also let's have a little fun. Just maybe then our, our ways will convey the holy promise, the ultimate power of resurrection, Sure, some will still scoff, but just maybe others will hear us again and one day will come to share the way of compassionate service, the truth of sacrificial love, the abundant life in peace that God leaves with us and intends for all in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, now and forever. Amen.